please tell me this works. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm hoping if anyone is there, please say hello to me. Please let me know that you can hear me. Um, I, I was just about to throw my laptop through the window. I tell you, I've had the internet crash. I've had Zoom playing up. I've had Facebook playing up. <laughs> you name it. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Um, and I'm hoping that my phone won't do something weird either. So, <laughs> whoever's there, hello. Please, please let me know in the comments um, if you can hear me. Um, because I have been known to talk for an hour on mute um, and that would be terrible so please just let me know comments will come up sometimes there's a bit of a lag but at least I'll know that I'm not talking to myself so over the next five days I want to talk to you a little bit about nutrition and menopause and I want to cover yay hi Ivana we can hear thank god for that <laughs> so um I want to talk about nutrition because nutrition is really 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 important during menopause and i want to talk about the time leading up the perimenopause that can start in the 30s menopause if menopause is technically 12 months one day after your last period but we use menopause as though it's an umbrella term so i really want to talk up about the period leading up to menopause that kind of weird year where you might not have a period but technically you aren't necessarily menopausal until you've had 12 months and one day because you can bleed after 11 months, that's always fun. And then also post-menopause. Now there are some key foundational nutritional recommendations for everybody, all women particularly, that doesn't matter what stage you're in, um, which I'm really going to talk about today and tomorrow. And then, um, so I'm going to talk about gut health today and why that's important for hormones. I'm going to talk about liver health tomorrow. Then I'm going to talk um, about something called pl like specific plant nutrients and in particular what we call um, phytoestrogens. I want to talk about those. And then um, on Thursday I'm going to talk about fasting um, in menopause and the differences between perimenopause and postmenopause. Uh, very little research, but there's a little bit coming through, and so I'm going to talk about my take on that. And then on Friday, I want to talk specifically about, okay, so I want to give you a chart that says if you're perimenopause, these are the foods, the nutrients that are really important. If you're kind of that menopause, postmenopause, this is what's really important, because your, your needs do change, your symptoms might change. Um, so this is what's important if you're in, in menopause not bleeding, if you're perimenopause still bleeding and if you're postmenopause when um, there are other issues to come. But, but it's going to cover the basics as well. So hopefully by the end of it I won't confuse you too much, I won't talk too much and that you'll have some really good tips. Now I had wanted to share a little PowerPoint with notes um, which I can't do because of internet and Zoom and Facebook and I, I guess um, the gods don't want me to. So I'm going to talk to you on my phone, but I have put in a handout with the slides. So all of the information that you need are in the slides and I'm going to do that for the rest of the week. I'm going to try as much as possible to give you lots of like charts and, and um, recipes and, and things that you can take away and, and that are useful and practical as much as possible. So, to start with, I want to talk about why um, why is gut health particularly important? Because today I want to talk about gut health, and it's a massive topic, and I will try very hard not to talk too much and to bore you, but gut health is really, really important. It doesn't actually matter whether you're perimenopause, menopause, post, it doesn't matter. It's really important for women um, because it, it has such an impact on their hormones. So... Oestrogen, which is one of our main female hormones, is really, really important for gut health. Um, and there's been some really interesting research to show that that oestrogen can prevent gut conditions such as reflux, um, esophageal cancer, ulcers, stomach cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, and colon cancer. And even though there's still lots we don't know about oestrogen, there is a link between um, estrogen and those conditions. And as we get older and estrogen declines, we can become more at risk of those um, gut conditions as well. We also know that 
the gut bacteria influence our estrogen it helps to regulate estrogen so estrogen is basically we have specific gut bacteria that produce an enzyme that basically puts estrogen back together after it's been pulled apart in the liver and i'll explain all about detoxification tomorrow so if you remember mr potato head used to take the hats and arms and legs off and then re-put them back on it's kind of what happens in the liver when we detoxify anything and so certain gut bacteria produce an enzyme that basically puts mr potato head back together and puts estrogen back together um which might be useful for some women and not very useful for others so the gut is really really important at, at regulating how much estrogen is actually being circulated in our body and sometimes we might want more estrogen sometimes we don't want more estrogen also there are certain types of estrogen we don't want so it does get complicated so the biggest key is that estrogen is important for our gut health and our gut health and in particular our gut bacteria influence and regulate the amount of estrogen that we have circulating in our body and so we know that when there's any kind of disruption to our gut bacteria then that can either create too much estrogen or it can create not enough estrogen and neither of those are great um it's really important with estrogen is that we have a good, a good balance uh, of of estrogen and we don't want too much we don't want too little when we have too much circulating estrogen that's then linked to things like endometriosis um breast cancer endometrial cancer and too little estrogen can lead to or possibly lead to um polycystic ovarian syndrome pcos we also like testosterone is really important for gut health that also helps to maintain motility um, in the colon and gets food moving through which reduces pain in the digestive tract decreases inflammation in the gut too reduces the effect of, of too much cortisol in the gut because cortisol affects our gut health um, and may protect from um, inflammatory bowel disease as well so we know testosterone is really important we, we make a little bit of testosterone and that is also mediated by our gut bacteria so you're starting to see how having a healthy gut is so important so we don't want an imbalance of gut bacteria what's known as dysbiosis because if we have low variety of gut bacteria if we have too much of one type and not enough of another type then that can create inflammation in the gut and that can then really impact our hormone balance which is really really important and has been linked to lots and lots of um, hormone imbalance type conditions such as the ones I've just talked about so it's really really important that we take our gut health seriously so there are three things that I think are really really important for our gut health one is to make sure that we get enough fiber one is to make sure we're eating prebiotics and one is our probiotic food so I'm going to talk about those three things so fiber is really really important and fiber is what we get from plants so you'll see this is why I bang on about plants so fiber is really I'm just going to move my phone a little bit and um, fiber is really really important for our gut health it's important for our heart health it's important for our hormone balance for cancer prevention and also weight management and we know from surveys that have been done in lots of countries around the world including New Zealand we just don't eat enough fiber so there's three different types there's what we call soluble fiber we've got insoluble fiber we've also got something called resistant starch which is kind of a prebiotic our gut bacteria kind of feed off of it and we know soluble fiber soluble fiber has been shown to lower blood uh, cholesterol slows the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream so really important to prevent things like diabetes and protect our heart um, insoluble fiber is a bit like a broom for our bum uh, that helps to prevent constipation it helps to prevent um, inflammatory bowel disease um, irritable bowel syndrome small intestinal bacterial overgrowth appendicitis diverticulitis 35 grams of fiber has been shown to reduce colon cancer um, it's also really really important it, it you know it can um, prevent uh, heart disease from occurring which if you are postmenopausal, you are at much higher risk of getting so it, this is why it's so important to look after your gut to prevent those conditions later in life um, as I said it can help to prevent things like diabetes the gut loves fiber it needs fiber in order to function properly 35 grams a day has been shown to reduce colon cancer 
Um, it helps with um, weight management as well because it will absorb water, it creates a feeling of fullness, it delays hunger. So you're not getting the high amounts of energy that can increase our weight, but we're feeling full. So that's really good and we're less likely to snack. Really, really important for hormones because it binds to estrogen and then it helps to remove it from the body when it's in high amounts and we don't really want it. Um, or not even estrogen that we make. We can take in estrogen from outside us with our perfumes and our cleaning products. There are so many chemicals that mimic estrogen um, and as a result can actually um, cause a huge amount of problems. They're, they're, we've got certain hormones that are really vulnerable to chemicals, our thyroid hormones, estrogen, testosterone in particular. So it's really important that, that we have the fiber to help remove the, the, the chemicals because that will get detoxified and broken down in, in our liver and then we need to pull it out. So fiber will help get rid of any kind of excess hormones or excess or chemicals that mimic those hormones, it'll help to get them out of our body too. So fiber is really, really important for that. So where do we get fiber from? We get it from, so soluble fiber, um, which is what's really important for lowering our cholesterol, our glucose, helps to kind of move food through our guts a little bit more slowly, it can soften our stools, really important for um, our, our lower gut, our colon to, to be healthy. And we get that from things like um, barley, oats, oat bran, rye, apples, citrus fruits, prunes, I love prunes, kiwi fruit, it's fantastic, you're gonna get your vitamin C as well as your soluble fiber, your beans, your legumes, any kind of seeds, um, you want the husk on your grain, so like um, your bran, psyllium is a really good form of it, and, and vegetables, particularly, um, you know, the, the apples are fantastic. Anything, the fleshy part of fruits and veggies are really, really, really um, rich in soluble fiber. And then your insoluble fiber, so that in, increases your, your stool weight, it helps to move your, the waste through and it provides that feeling of fullness and and that, that's really important too and both of them are, are really important for our gut bacteria so you get insoluble fiber from things like brown rice from anything that's got the brown or the husk on um fruits again your beans um your cabbages carrots brussels sprouts wheat bran whole grains flax seeds psyllium so a lot of the plant basically plants if you're eating plants and you're eating a whole plant the skin and and the, the middle part um, and it's not refined, you're going to get the soluble and the insoluble fiber. And they're both really, really, really important for our gut health. Resistant starch, things like um, slightly greener bananas, really important for as resistant starch. And then things like potato salad, if it's been cooked and cooled, the potatoes, again, really good for the gut. And the same thing with rice, cooked rice and then cooled rice call it in the fridge they don't call it outside otherwise you get tummy ache um and having rice salads so potato salads and rice salads are really really important um form of resistant starch as well again really important for the um for the gut where do you get fiber from so um some other ideas um about the amounts in particular so as I said, eat plants, you're going to get fibre if you eat plants. Uh, just 100 grams of rolled oats will give you about 10 grams of fibre and you're aiming for around 25 to 30 grams of fibre a day. So it doesn't take much. You know, a slice of rye bread or sourdough bread, you could get about 2 grams. Most fruits will contain about 2 grams of fibre. Most beans and legumes contain up to 6 to 8 grams of fibre. Um, and I think you get about five grams of, of fiber for like half a cup of ch cooked chickpeas. So it's, it's, if you're eating lots of plants throughout the day, it's easy to get your, your fiber content. It's just, we don't eat enough plants. If you're looking at processed foods, then look on the label. When you look on a label, look for where it says, don't look per serve, look per hundred grams. Cause that's much more realistic, um, thing to look at and get an idea. Cause we don't always eat what the serving is. And you're looking for anything that's got more than five grams of fiber per 100 grams, then again, you're kind of in the right place. So you're aiming as much as possible. You can get apps where you can follow what you eat, Easy Diet Diary. Um, I think there's like the Fitbits have like nutrition apps. There's, I can't remember at the top of my head, menopause brain, but there's loads of different apps where you can actually track what you eat. And so really track up to 30, 30 grams of fiber a day is what you really want. 
um, then you know that you're you're doing really well. If you're not into tracking apps, then actually 30 plants plus a week, you will get fiber easily. Um, and I'll talk more about that later on. So I've kind of talked about 25 grams is the recommended daily amount, um, up to, to 30 to 35 grams, depending if you're in New Zealand or Britain. I think Britain has slightly higher, um, it's up to, it's only 30 grams. I think 35 grams is the recommended amount to prevent colon cancer in New Zealand. You don't want to have too much. So 30, 35 grams is a good amount. If you go crazy, then it can actually bind to minerals and stop you absorbing your minerals. Um, it can make you feel so full that you then don't eat and then you're not getting enough nutrients and it can cause discomfort. So you really don't want to have a huge amount straight away. If, if you're someone that doesn't eat a lot of veggies, you really want to increase your veggies slowly over time. So if you only have one vegetable a day, start having two vegetables a day and then build up slowly because if you go straight into the 30, 30 plants a week and you only ever had five plants a week then you're going to get tummy ache and you can get bloating and you can get really quite uncomfortable so if you're wanting to bring on any kind of vegetables probiotics fiber prebiotic foods start slowly and work your way up don't go full out because you can feel really crap and that's really important. And it's also really important that you drink water because that will um, that can actually help um, so that you don't get kind of clogged up with the fiber. So increase slowly over a period of a few weeks. Allow the gut to adapt if it's not used to having fiber in, in your diet. Drink lots of water in order to soften the fiber. Getting fiber from a variety of sources is really important. Try not to rely on supplements for fiber if you can. It's much better if we get it from food. Um, and again, if mineral, if you, if you know you're not getting enough minerals, then just start slowly and build up. As you increase your plants, you will increase your mineral content. Eat fruits and veggies with the skin on where you can. Eat whole grains that have not been processed to death. Um, that would be better. Um, and your, your nuts and your seeds whole. And then add beans and legumes to your soups and your stews and your salads. So, you know, when you have a salad, think of adding some black, black beans or some kidney beans or some chickpeas. Um, if you struggle with beans, I, I know I do, then I find only having one bean at a time can help. And sometimes having it... Um, as a paste like hummus, I'm okay with hummus. I'm not great with chickpeas. Um, a little bit of chickpeas, okay. But if the minute if I'm if I had a bean mix, I'd be in agony. So I I, I tend to go for hummus and I add hummus um, and mix that in rather than having just chickpeas. I'm okay with black beans. So I'll just have a small amount and I'll just add that. And I don't have big bean mixes, and I find that that's um, that's doable. So again, you're going to play and it might be that blitzing it up and having it almost like a, a type of hummus, black bean, bean hummus or cannellini bean hummus is actually really tasty. And that sometimes can be more digestible than the actual full bean. As long as you're blitzing it all up and eating it, you're still getting the fiber. So prebiotics. So the prebiotics are basically substances that support the, the actions of probiotics or they provide a fuel source for beneficial bacteria. They're not actually food. Um, bacteria don't eat them, but they ferment them, and that then produces um, things that are really beneficial for us. So they support the actions of our gut bacteria or, or probiotics. There's lots of emerging research to show that it can be beneficial for the gut, the heart, our mood, and our brain, our bone health, our immunity, and our inflammation. So again, this is important regardless of whether you're perimenopausal or postmenopausal. If you're postmenopausal, you are at much higher risk of heart disease and, and, and um, osteoporosis, arthritis, you know, all those kind of bone, bone um, conditions. So prebiotics are really important, but actually it's better to have it earlier on than when you're in postmenopause. So it should be something that you have all the time regardless of what age or stage you're, you're in as a woman. But if you're postmenopausal and you don't have prebiotics, it's it's worth considering bringing them in your diet along with the fiber because it will have a huge impact on your heart and your bone health in particular. And as I said, immunity, inflammation, all of those things are really important. So again, in your slides, you'll see the notes. There's actually a chart that talks about the different prebiotic foods. So have a look at that table 
and you can pick things as long as you're having something there every day you're going to be getting prebiotic food so whether that's your potato salad or bananas or cashew nuts or lentils or whole grains if you can tolerate garlic and leeks and onions um which I know not everyone can. If you've got gut issues, sometimes they can be a problem. It might be the garlic oil is better than having um, full garlic. Flax seeds, vegetables, fruits, berries, a bit of chocolate contains polyphenols and polyphenols are prebiotic. So your cocoa, chocolate, berries, um, stone fruit. I love stone fruit. Um, so there's lots of things that you can eat every day doesn't mean you eat chocolate three times a day, but having a little bit of chocolate now and again is actually really good for your gut. So um, have a play, have a look at that chart of prebiotic foods and just play around and make sure you're getting something every day that you know it is a prebiotic food and you're on your right track. And just remember, plants can a prebiotic, okay? A steak is not prebiotic. I love steak. You wanna make sure you're having your vegetables and your plants alongside your steak and then you'll be fine. So now I want to talk to you about the bacteria in our gut bacteria. So they are really important because they actually produce some of our vitamins, our Bs and our and our vitamin K, which is really important for our heart and bone health. Hello, postmenopausal women. Um, they actually help to break down food, specifically, especially protein. And we need more protein as we get older. So on Friday, I'll talk a little bit more about what, what our needs are as we get older. It helps with the production of bile, which is really important for the absorption of fat and also the removal of waste. Helps with our, our liver function and our detoxification. It can help prevent allergy. So sometimes if we have, sometimes as you'll find that you suddenly hit that perimenopause, menopause stage and you've become more allergic to anything and everything, not just food, it could be anything. Um, I would say the gut is where it's really important because if you have dysbiosis this imbalance of gut bacteria that can actually exacerbate and drive allergies so again really important it controls the ph of our gut which protects us from uh, bacteria and viruses that are going to make us sick and also cancer it keeps the bad bacteria in check very important for reducing inflammation which drives so many chronic health conditions that can affect us when we're postmenopausal. helps to regulate our immune system hugely linked to our, our mental health and our brain health, linked to many chronic conditions. So we're really just only touching the surface at how important our gut bacteria is. And I say gut bacteria, we also have some really beneficial yeasts um, and other microorganisms. So when I say bacteria, it isn't just bacteria, it's actually lots of different microorganisms. Most important thing is, as I said before, our gut bacteria regulate our hormones, particularly our estrogen and testosterone. So you want to have a healthy gut bacteria in order to have healthy hormones. If you have any kind of imbalance in your gut, it's going to affect your hormones. Um, and actually also our thyroid hormones, not just our, our reproductive hormones, but hugely important for all of our hormone balance, including insulin and lots of other hormones. So things that can affect our gut bacterial balance our diet so we can control that our stress if you are hugely chronically stressed you will impact your gut bacteria and not for the not for the good so it's really important that you manage um your stress levels find a way to to become more resilient and, and to manage your stress whether that's breathing or reading coloring in being out in nature moving your body whatever it is it doesn't matter but getting a handle on your stress and feeling like you are in control is really important because that will affect your gut bacteria and it will affect your gut health and your hormone health. Medications will also affect your gut bacteria. It's not always easy to manage that. So that's why what you eat and how you live and your movement, that will actually counterbalance what goes on in, in, with your medication. And I'll talk about the importance of the liver tomorrow. And the liver is very important for that. And alcohol. So alcohol will definitely affect your gut bacteria balance. And alcohol will basically, will, will actually affect your estrogen levels as well. So again, I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow and talk about the liver. So the things that you can manage is your, your the amount of alcohol you have, how you manage your stress and what you eat make a massive difference to your gut bacteria. 
So one of the ways we do that, we've obviously talked about fiber, which is really important for our gut health. We've talked about prebiotics, but probiotics are really important too. And for me, it's more about probiotic food. So probiotics are basically substances that stimulate the growth of microorganisms within our gut, especially those that are beneficial. So your gut bacteria and your gut yeasts that are beneficial. And the way we get pro probiotics in is through fermented foods, fermented dairy foods and fermented non-dairy foods. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. And also freeze-dried powders. So that's in the form of a capsule or it can be um, powder. And that doesn't have to be live bacteria that's been capsulated. We've also seen some um, research where um, the bacteria, in particular the bacteria, is actually dead but it's still producing effects that are beneficial in our body. Um, but most of the studies have been done on live bacteria, which is why I like food, because that's actually live bacteria. Um, so why is it so important? Because they produce something called short chain fatty acids. They feed our cells in our gut, particularly our colon. They protect the gut lining. Um, and in doing that, that that's it's these short chain fatty acids that have been shown to be hugely beneficial by reducing inflammation and by re being really really important for our gut health and our gut health, our brain health and a whole bunch of other things. So it's these short chain fatty acids that our gut bacteria make. They are the things that are actually really 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 beneficial, and that's what all the research is now looking at. So when we take probiotics. We're actually trying to support what's already there. Probiotics work their way through. They don't stay in our gut. So whether it's a supplemental form or whether it's food form, they're basically just trying to support and help um, our gut bacteria repopulate itself. So they don't repopulate. They just kind of are space holders. They defend our gut. They take up space so that bad bacteria and bad bacteria isn't necessarily bad bacteria it's just too much sometimes of one specific strain they actually stop them from over reproducing and making us sick a lot of probiotics actually produce antibiotic substances that are really beneficial so they will kill off any bacteria that we don't really want in our gut or drive them away they will create an environment in our gut that is only um, hospitable to the bacteria we actually want in our gut. Sometimes they actually steal food from the bacteria um, to stop them from replicating and they work as a team. So they almost, they provide intelligence and surveillance information for the bacteria that's in our gut that we want. The problem with buying it in, in a supplemental form is that you don't want probiotics that have got 500 different strains in because they don't all like each other so sometimes even if it's good bacteria they will kill off other good bacteria by poking holes in them or by starving them by stealing their food so you really want strains that you know have been researched and that do actually like each other so more is not better necessarily um you do have to be careful if you're having fermented foods or probiotics uh, you can have too much and that can create issues if you have something like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth you'll find that you'll actually get more gut symptoms so you do have to be careful and it's really important to start with small small amounts and work your way up because you don't want to have too much um, if you were going to take supplemental probiotics then that's better if you really don't have a good diet if you are chronically stressed if you're taking or have taken pro um, antibiotics and really you should be taking probiotics for a good six months don't take them just one bottle and that's it it's not enough it needs to be at least six months to actually to take up space and allow your good gut bacteria to repopulate if you routinely take things like paracetamol antidepressants steroid medication because they do affect our gut balance that's a really good time to consider taking probiotics in supplemental form um, or if you have irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease or diarrhea, it might be worth considering taking a probiotic. If you're run down, if you're getting frequent infections, if you've got allergies, then again, it might be worth considering it. There's some emerging research about obesity, inflammatory joint disease, diabetes, mental health disorders, and specific, specific strains in probiotics. So, Come and talk to me about that if that's something you're interested in. 
What I think is really, really important is that when we're going through perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause is that we look at fermented foods. So as alongside our fiber and alongside our prebiotic foods is to increase our fermented foods. Every culture in the world has some kind of fermented food. And when we have the standard American diet, or the SAD diet, we don't tend to have it. And that in itself is not necessarily beneficial. So it's really important that we look at trying to get some in our diet. So that could be fermented dairy. If you're okay with dairy, then that's when you should be trying to find ways to get fermented dairy in your diet. And it might be that you can't have cow's milk, but you can have fermented dairy. I know for me, I can actually manage a little bit of fermented dairy. So that's yogurt, basically. It's really easy. Just make sure that it's plain yogurt. You also want to make sure that it's got bacteria added you don't just want the bacteria that turns it into yogurt and makes it sour you want the ones that, that have got the extra um bacteria added to so that's your lactobacillus acidophilus and your bifidobacterium look for that so yogurt's really important you can get fermented um dairy in the form of kefir which again is really beneficial there's some been really interesting research just done on kefir that shows that it can be really important for gut health heart health bone health cheese is actually a form of um fermented dairy don't want too much just a little bit and again if only if you can tolerate it and you can also get fermented butter so this is when you're looking for cultured butter so again it's not that they've had they, they, they've actually added the bacteria to make it slightly sour um, and then that's also um, a form of fermented dairy you've got fermented soy which is really important because that makes something called um well you, soy has something called phy phytoestrogen as part of the soy and when it's fermented it actually makes it more available to us so i'm going to be talking a lot more about that on wednesday so that's your miso, your tempeh. I think tempeh is kind of gross, um, but I like miso. Um, tamari, I love. That's also gluten-free. Um, and natto, which is kind of too. But some people love tempeh and natto, and if you do, fill your boots. If not, miso and tamari are really good. Um, forms of fermented soy. And then your fermented vegetables. Again, I love fermented vegetables. This is your kimchi, which is slightly um, slightly fiery. It's got chili in it and sauerkraut, which is your cabbage. I love red cabbage sauerkraut. That's really good. And the cabbage juice, just having a little, a little bit of the cabbage, of the juice and the sauerkraut is really good for your gut. And dill pickles. Um, if you look at the slides, I talk a little bit about um, how to... Um, how to ferment the ratio and there's a recipe book i've put up that's got in there about how to make sauerkraut as well it's i have actually made sauerkraut and kimchi i've completely cocked up kefir um but fermented veggies are really easy kombucha i love kombucha i've tried to make it i cannot make it fizzy um but i love buying it so this is basically um black tea or green tea that's been fermented um it does the yeast basically the yeast and bacteria do turn the sugar into alcohol um it turns it into also carbon dioxide which is where you get your fizz from um some of the bacteria actually can convert the alcohol into that kind of vinegary taste the acetic acid so, but there is some small amounts of alcohol can remain and there's lots of live bacteria still in the kombucha as well which is really cool um i know people that make it and it's fantastic do i have a preferred um br branch of kombucha my brand <laughs> preferred yeah i do and it's the alcoholic version unfortunately so i absolutely love i think it's daily organics oh i love it um it used to be you could buy it from new world and then um you could buy it from the supermarket and then they actually had a look at how much alcohol was in the kombucha and there was quite a bit i think it's only four or five percent it's not massive but it's enough to be considered alcohol so then they took it off the shelves um and I think now it's coming back into some of the new worlds. Um, I have to, where I live out west, I have to go to Boric in Kumio and I can buy it there. And it's in the alcohol section. That's probably why I liked it so much because it tastes, to me, it tasted really hoppy. It tasted like beer. So instead of alcohol, I was having that. I was obviously still drinking alcohol. But to be honest, the alcohol amount is still tiny compared to having beer because I think it's only 4 or 5%. Yeah, typical of me, but I still think it's the nicest tasting kombucha. There's there's lots of different kombuchas out there. I find 
to me it's almost like drinking pop but it's going to have less sugar than pop but I the best form is making it yourself but I'm crap at it it just doesn't work it just tastes to me like vinegar so I do buy my own kombucha but I absolutely love daily organics and I just have it instead of alcohol I'll have a, I don't have masses I put it in a wine glass I drink it like alcohol and I know that it's going to be better for me than alcohol and I absolutely love it so that's my favorite form of kombucha so have, have a glass on me know that it's a treat um Apple cider vinegar is actually a fermented food. Um, it's basically crushed apples that they add yeast to the crushed apples. That ferments it, um, ferments the sugars, and that turns that also slightly into add, um, alcohol. Then they add bacteria to it to further ferment. And then again, it does the same thing as the kombucha. It turns the alcohol into that acetic acid, which is what's found in vinegar. So apple cider vinegar is actually a type of fermented food. It's really good and, and it may actually help lower blood sugar um, and it may help to improve insulin sensitivity. So again, protecting us from diabetes in our later life is really important. So I love apple cider vinegar. I put it on salads. Um, I actually think just a little shot in the morning is actually sometimes better than lemon juice. I know that lemon juice can actually damage your teeth. So I just have a, like a, a teaspoon of vinegar, add some water and, and take a shot. It's actually really good for your gut too. It gets things moving. It's not the best tasting thing in the world. Some people hate it. And that's where maybe a slice of lemon would be better. I don't do squeeze lemon because I don't think that's good for your teeth, but a slice of lemon is good. But if you can tolerate apple cider vinegar, then just a little teaspoon, add, a, add some water to it and have it as a shot. Um, can be really, really beneficial. But I love it with a little bit of olive oil and, I, and put it on salads. I tend to use anything that asks for vinegar, I use apple cider vinegar instead of other types of vinegar. The only time I use any other type of vinegar is malt vinegar on chips now and again maybe and and white, white vinegar I use to clean. So apple cider vinegar, go and get some apple cider vinegar. And then there's sourdough, which is your, basically your fermented bread. Um, I think it's one of the best forms of bread. I love it. Um, it may support gut health. If you know that you're okay with, with the wheat and gluten, then sourdough bread is your best bet. Um, it, again, might aid blood sugar management. It may reduce the risk of heart disease. There's a little bit of research, not much. It's, I find it easier to digest, and it, and it may actually be more nutritious because it's fermented, and it's... It's the one, you know, the way we used to eat bread as well. So I really like, when I can, I will get sourdough bread. I have made it. Um, I love it. Um, and I don't always make it as often as I would like. So I do buy it when I'm not making it. But I love sourdough bread. I think it's fantastic. Um, I haven't actually worked out how to make a sourdough gluten-free. So maybe if anyone knows how to make sourdough gluten-free, let, let us know the recipe. So my tips for you, again, it's on, on the slide if you have a look. 30 plants a week. This is why I bang on about it. So it's, and when I say plants, it's not vegetables. Um, it's any plant. So you're looking for the, to, to try and increase that range of plants that you're having. The greater the variety of plants, the greater the variety of gut bacteria, that equals a healthy gut. It's really important. So... If you're having carrot, count it once. Have carrot once, then tick it off, it's done. But you can have red and yellow and orange capsicum. You can have different types of parsley. So herbs and spices count as plants. Your gut loves it. Plus all those herbs and spices are also anti-inflammatory, which is really important, again, as we move into post-menopause and we have those risks of heart disease. That's driven by inflammation. So... You know, flat leaf parsley, Italian parsley, you've got your purple basil, your Thai basil, your green basil. That, that's three different basils, that's three different plants. You're looking at your brown rice, your white rice, your red rice, your black rice, different types of quinoa, mixing up your nuts and your seeds. Every type of nut and seed is a different plant. So it's really easy to get 30 plants in a week. And if you can manage 30 plants over a week, you're going to be getting your fiber. You're going to be getting your prebiotic foods. It's really easy. So have a play with that. That'll be like the number one thing you take away from this week is get your 30 plants a week in. You will be making a massive difference to managing perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, and your health in the future. Like that's the number one thing because it covers so much. 
so aim for 30 grams of fiber a day you can use an app to get that 30 grams but i'm telling you if you get 30 plants a week you'll be getting 30 grams of fiber every day um, because that variety will just make sure that you're getting lots of different types of fiber rich foods um, if you buy packaged foods then again look at the label for more than five grams of fiber per hundred grams and that's also going to be adding to that it's really important eating fermented foods every day start small build up to a tablespoon at every meal so you know as i said your yogurt um i have a shot of kefir now and again i love coconut kefir it's really expensive so I mix it up sometimes i'll have um dairy kefir sometimes i'll have coconut kefir you can make kefir with just plain water um so and if you can make it yourself that'll save you a fortune i know somebody used to make kefir with water and they used to use lemon um lemon rind and and um sultanas to just get the fizz going and the sugar and it was amazing so water kefir is actually really lovely most of the research that's been shown beneficial results has all been done on dairy kefir so if you can tolerate it play with that but the sauerkraut kimchi have you know when you're having a having a lunch have a, a little bit of a sauerkraut if you can you can have your yogurts and your kefirs for your for your breakfast you can have the sourdough bread for your breakfast in the evening you can have your, your kombucha alongside your main meal instead of your alcohol it's it's really easy to get it, that in so apple cider vinegar shot of apple cider vinegar in the morning with water to get your your day going and it get everything going everything moves when you have that um you know adding apple cider vinegar to your salad at lunch or um adding a little bit into your to your soups and your stews and your dinner in the evening you're still going to be getting you, it won't kill the minerals you can still st you'll still get something from it so it's really easy throughout your day to add a little bit of fermented food but as i said start start small 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 build it up and just see how you manage it so if you could do those things if you can you know have 30 plants plus a week if you can make sure you're getting enough fiber every day if you're eating fermented foods every day and you're drinking lots of water alongside that then you're already halfway there to having having hormone balance because of how our gut interacts with our hormones and our hormones interact with our gut you're halfway there so i'm hoping that i haven't talked too long i haven't bored you that you've got tips there you can take away as i said doesn't matter if you're perimenopause in that menopause kind of window or your post menopause gut health is massive regardless so this is your foundation doesn't matter what stage you're at this is your foundation tomorrow I'm going to talk about liver health. I'm hoping that Zoom will work tomorrow. If it doesn't, again, I'm just going to put the slides in to the group. Um, and I think I've got some recipes for you tomorrow as well on liver health. Um, I think I've got a smoothie or a juice or, I don't know, tea. I've got a few things that different ways of supporting your liver. Again, really, really, really important, um, regardless of whether you're peri- menopause post liver health is really important and goes alongside that gut health so this is your the next two days this is your foundation regardless of what stage you're at so that's tomorrow and i think that will be at five tomorrow as well live at five tomorrow so let me know ask questions let me know if this has been helpful please tell me in the group what your key takeaways what did you learn that you think right that's what i'm going to work on this is really important to me this is what i'm gonna this is gonna be my my goal to myself over the next couple of weeks let me know what that is i love to know that and um, if there's any fermented foods prebiotic foods anything like that that you think that's been beneficial beneficial for me please again share that in the group so we can all learn from each other so have a fantastic rest of your monday night i need to go uh what's the time six o'clock oh my god gotta go and have dinner and then i've got a meeting at quarter past six so have fun enjoy your monday evening please let me know what you what you got from this and what your takeaways are have a fantastic monday and i hope i haven't talked too fast had a lot to get through